Welcome, everyone. I am really excited to talk to Ilya today, who has had 14 years of ML experience, most recently staff engineer at Meta. He's worked at Twitter, Adobe, and also the Department of Labor, which is really relevant because we're going to be talking about trends in the software industry as it relates to this wave of ML and AI that is coming. You know, there's so many venture capitalists and CEOs and other people who talk about this huge wave of AI and how it's going to change the whole industry. What don't you like about, you know, all this talk of AI? Yeah, there was a viral tweet that you shared uh, that uh, says that, you know, the days of getting the $200,000 job at 22 are probably over. And I'm still seeing people getting $200,000 or more offers at 22 and 24. One thing that I really don't like about that is that it really changes people's lives, right? Like I see a lot of people who uh, change how they perceive the industry are getting really skittish about the career that they've picked and gotten really good at. In the meantime, it's all based on hype. It's all based on people's opinions whose wallets very much depend on uh, the imminence of AGI. Mm. And and uh, AGI, artificial general intelligence, right? That's when you can basically say that there's a parity between any human and uh, AI, so to speak. And I don't think we're there. I don't think we'll be there for the next decade or two. I'm not worried about uh, engineering jobs going away in the next two decades, because at its core, engineering is about taking a big problem and breaking it down into pieces and solving those pieces. It requires a lot of planning. It requires a lot of context. It requires a lot of things that current machine learning techniques just cannot replicate. We're not actually spending all that much effort on breadth of techniques right now. Now, uh, because you see, you know, announcements all the time that like we're buying, you know, hundred billion dollars of yeah. H100 GPUs, and so like the techniques that we're going to be using are going to be very limited uh, for the next little bit. Yeah, we can scale them. We'll see incremental progress from that, but we're not going to see conceptual understanding of anything. What I'd like to encourage you to do is to not freak out. Uh, and to plan your career as if the robots are not going to take it in the next 10 years. Uh, you know, in 30 years, we'll talk. Yeah. But but the next 10, 20 years, I think you're okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Because like, you know, when people, when I tell, give advice to people on TAR or otherwise, I tell them, you know, don't try and plan out your career for 10 years. 10 years, the whole world is going to change in 10 years. Who knows what's going to happen? Think ahead to the next one or two years and figure out who are the people, the technologies you want to work with and optimize that. And so it sounds like you're saying the same thing of like, hey, in the next few years, you anticipate there will still be many really amazing opportunities for good engineers, either ML engineers or just normal engineers like, like me, right? And so I think that's a great perspective. At the same time, though, it's undeniable that for folks like me and you who are, you know, watching this industry, like you're deep in the industry, you go to conferences, you read papers, it's undeniable that AI or ML has changed how we develop software. And so I wonder if you just forecast ahead, like tell us what you think will happen in the next two to three years as it relates to development and integration of these different tools, uh, you know, in a medium or large tech company, how will it change software development? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and I'd like to just point out the assumption that was implicit in what you said that ML engineers are not normal. I, I tend to agree with it. Uh, you're right. There is a distinction between ML engineers and normal engineers. Normal, yeah. But uh, <laughs> so at this point in my life, I don't write a lot of boilerplate code anymore. So I still write a lot of code, but a lot of the stuff that I do that's boilerplate, that's like LLM can do really well. Uh, I'm going to outsource to LLM. And uh, the good news about it is that I still know programming languages well enough to be able to spot check it and understand that like, oh, you know, that's a library that doesn't exist. Or, you know, like I wouldn't do it this way because that introduces a memory leak or whatever. But it's more of a code review kind of mentality for a lot of the code that I produce these days. I don't think that's actually going to get much more than it is currently, because in order to solve some of the other problems in code generation, you're going to need to have deep understanding on the part of these tools as to like concepts within uh, software engineering space and i don't think they're there i don't think i don't think that's a thing that can be developed with current architectures i think we'll see increased adoption of these techniques i think there will definitely be better and better assist tools but i think it's going to be more on the autopilot uh, side of the spectrum where the pilot is still primarily in control of the plane but you know in cruise yeah sure like 
take over. All these problems are things that we can understand. And then in terms of the division between machine learning engineers and normal engineers, I think the spectrum is going to broaden. There are going to be so many places that we're going to want to apply machine learning techniques that there's going to be both more room for people who are specialized in machine learning, and there's also going to be more room for people who are not. And increasingly, if you're doing any kind of engineering, you're going to have to understand something about machine learning because mm. you are going to be using those libraries. You are going to be implementing ML techniques into your product. And, uh, you know, I think very much about this in terms of both of us have encountered uh, the shift from SRE to like DevOps, where the SRE just kind of got consumed into the DevOps philosophy, but they're still SREs. And the SREs that are there now, you know, we used to call them uh, production MPs, right, at, at Meta. Like those people still provide a lot of value. It's just that the value they provide is in a lot more concentrated areas where, and every team has on-call. S- same way, every team is going to have some ML responsibility. So basically, let me say back to you, site reliability engineers were kind of eaten up by, you know, DevOps or more broad engineering fields in the same way that a similar thing will likely happen with ML engineers. They'll just kind of be eaten up and a lot of engineers will just start to subsume or like, have to understand parts of it. So, you know, I think a a common question, making this really practical, I'm a mid-level or senior engineer at Meta or Airbnb or Oracle. I'm a good engineer. I can do my job well. Is it enough to just use things like GitHub Copilot or Cursor or, hey, I use Gemini and ChatGPT for debugging. I'm a practitioner of AI. Is that enough? Or are you recommending that I should really go in and like understand the math behind AI and the cutting edge of what is coming around the bend in the next year or two. Like, where are you on that spectrum of advice? Yeah, I think it depends a little bit on how relevant you want to be uh, and how long you want to be relevant for. I think if, you know, you're a year from retirement, take it easy. Yeah. Just <laughs> kick back, you know. If relevance in the longer term is important to you, I think about it in terms of three uh, different buckets of skills. So there are fundamental ML skills, you know, this might include some math, don't freak out. The math is not complicated. I taught it to my nine-year-old. Like it's not, it's not hard. Then there is, you know, like, like what you said, like practitioner, like how does this impact my job, the product that I'm working on right now? And then there is the future state bucket where it's like, I want to encourage people uh, to keep like half an eye over the horizon and see what's coming there. Because I think in the long term you're going to benefit tremendously from doing that. But I want to caution that like not all three of these things are equally important. Yeah. Uh, and so the way that I would do it is if, if I am like a mid-level engineer in one of those companies and I'm, you know, I probably already am struggling with the workload because usually companies put on you as much as you can handle. And so I would start by finding space in my day. And the way you find space in your day is by understanding how to use those techniques right now, understanding how to use the tools that help you in development. We are lucky enough to be in a career where we can write our own tools. And uh, if, if you understand machine learning techniques, you can write better tools. You can write tools that solve more problems uh, for yourself, right? To free up time so you can use it elsewhere. And so that's definitely the first place I would start. In general, whenever I advise people on how to learn machine learning, I say, you know, start with the problem you have, get your hands dirty. Like you're not gonna understand a lot of things. It's not gonna be production grade the first week. That's okay. But when you go to learn about these things now, you have like a foundational like, okay, this didn't work because I didn't do this or whatever. Mm. And if you can connect that to uh, the concept that you're learning, you're learning those concepts in a lot more depth. So once you figure out where you're at and how ML techniques apply where you're at, then go and brush up on the fundamentals and learn the fundamentals really well. And there's nothing more fundamental than knowing when to apply the machine learning technique and when not to apply machine learning technique. Machine learning techniques are specifically really good in situations where you have a lot of data uh, and you cannot, for the life of you, ever write a set of rules that will cover everything. Even if the if statement is really complex, but I have a choice between an if statement and a machine learning technique, I'm gonna go with an if statement every time. You use machine learning technique for things like find a face in the picture where there is absolutely no feature you can design that will find the face. So once you have those fundamentals, you know where to apply machine learning and where not to. And then I would only look over the horizon once I mastered the fundamentals because it actually is more harmful to you to go there 
before you have the fundamentals uh, under your belt. Yeah, so start where you are, learn fundamentals, and only then look over the horizon. And the way that I recommend doing that is find somebody you trust. If they have a podcast or something that doesn't come up super frequently, because you don't want to be lost in the noise. You don't want to be like, oh, this new model is like the the brilliant thing that it is. And it then you start digging into it and like on five metrics out of the 10, it's better, but on five metrics, it's worse. And you're like, I don't know how to reconcile that. So kind of try to stay above the noise level. So maybe every two weeks, spend an hour uh, looking at what's what's happening Yeah. and don't necessarily focus on models, focus on like techniques, focus on like, did anything really new come out in DeepSeek? Yes, there are a couple of things in DeepSeek that are quite new. Don't catch on every model because that that's a recipe for going Yeah, insane. I mean, I think fu fundamentals are, by definition, they're fundamental because they are unchanging regardless of the abstraction you put on top. So I totally see the value in just like looking at fundamentals. And, and one of the issues with like the third category, and, and I think why you're cautioning people, is that every time you look out to the horizon, to me, as someone who's not as deep as you are, it feels like every time I look at the horizon, it totally, it looks different. <laughs> Like the thing on the horizon is always like some hot new technology that's going to change everything. I'll give you an example. And I know you have a hot take on this. Like a year ago, we actually worked with a partner company at Taro to do some rag based um, search. Okay, we're going to constrain the output of this LLM to look at the documents that we have on Taro. And it kind of worked, but actually the company that offered that service to us went out of business. And that's an example of like, it, to me, it feels like rag has kind of fallen out of favor more broadly. right? Or it's heading in that direction. So like, I think that's a, a risk of always looking at the hot new thing. That knowledge is not as durable as the fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, I think that RAG is a terrific thing to learn. But before then, I would learn how to dust off the punch cards to feed into the computer. Right. Uh, because I think, you know, pretty soon they're going to be in the same dustbin of history. I think RAG is an interesting hack to get around fundamental problems in some of these models. But the, these are problems that practitioners are really well aware of and we're fixing. And so it's like lots of companies that try to create a business that then gets eaten by OpenAI and other major players. Like if it's a problem that's so apparent that the practitioners are gonna be aware of it, sure, like it, it might be, RAG might be useful to you in the next like eight months. And then like, we're not going to come up with a better answer in the next eight months. But if I'm doing something for three years from now, like if I'm learning RAG for fun, because I think that, you know, this is the future of the industry, it's not. And the way that you can distinguish that is really by mastering the fundamentals and really seeing what what is true and what isn't. I think please don't take your ML advice from like news and uh people who haven't worked in it and uh, people who seem super enthusiastic or super skeptical. Honestly, like there are a lot of useful things that happen here, but I agree. I think anybody who's not a machine learning engineer by trade, who's going to go and read through the proceeding of NeurIPS or like some other top flight conference, I think you're just asking for trouble. And so speaking about, you know, how it might not be a good use of time for most people to like look at all the papers coming out of a top flight conference like NeurIPS, I do think that what a lot of companies are testing for is how does ML fit into the broader picture? How does it fit into the broader system of engineering a, a new feature or a new product? And so you have done many, many interviews across your time as a staff engineer, ML engineer at Meta, Twitter, Adobe. And you've packed that up into a guide on, on Taro. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Just for people who are curious, what would be like one tidbit you could share from the course about ML system design interviews? Yeah, so lots of people have learned things about ML and, you know, or even have the title of ML engineer, but they don't understand how it all fits together. And when it all fits together, the thing that you have to think about is the trade-offs. In fact, I did two mock interviews like this morning, right before we were recording this. Uh, and uh, for both of them, I was like, like you're answering my question, but you're not giving me like a couple of different trade-offs that I can... start understanding and understand the pluses and minuses and how to um, put this into production. This is where, you know, mastering the ML fundamentals really comes in, even though ML fundamentals is a different interview, but like understanding enough of the fundamentals to be able to know that there are multiple roads and they lead me to slightly different places. And I have to understand within the system, is latency more important to me or is uh, ML model performance more important to me? Um, and uh, those kinds of things are hard to understand. So in the course, I actually 
have a couple of like these long tables of like, you know, you have five options here, choose whichever one based on the pros and cons. Uh, that's a resource I wish I had when I was interviewing at bigger tech companies. If you come to that interview and you don't know like any of the techniques, you're, you don't have a chance of passing anyway, yeah. right? But uh, what people don't understand is that they go for the first technique that's useful to them and they completely forget that like, no, like my goal here is to make the correct trade-off and to be a good engineer. And so that's what I hope the course really solidifies. Yeah, I mean, there is a ton of investment and energy going into ML at pretty much every type of company. And it, because it's so new, I, I feel like there are not many people of your level, of your caliber, who are sharing how do you get into these companies? How do you pass the interview? What kind of discussions should, should you be having? Which is why, what I think your course does such a good job at. So I'm really excited for people to get some value out of that. You also have a YouTube channel, so I'll leave a link for that. There's a lot of good stuff you put out there. Uh, where else should I point people to as we wrap up the video? Um, YouTube channel or Substack. Um, those are uh, those are the two primary ones. Okay. And I'm MLE path on every platform, so. All right, so I'll leave a link for MLE path, the handles, and then YouTube and Substack in the description. Mm -hmm. Ilya, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Errol.